Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, episode 423, Pedestal, the Final Curtain. As one can imagine, the second the Ohio was in her resting place, men rushed forward to begin to pump the oil within her. And though everyone else on the Ohio got off, grateful to do so, Fred Larson stayed around to help with the work. Honestly, he had nowhere to go. He did not know the island, and he had pumped oil before. Better to be doing something than do nothing. And apparently, the pilots of the Axis felt the same way as air raid alarms started going off. Larson asked what he was supposed to do, and he was told to head for the caves where he would be safe and he could get a hot meal. As he had not had real food in the last four days, Larson's stomach decided for him. Soon he had a shower and a breakfast in his belly. Not that everything went swimmingly. Larson still had his sweater from Norway with him, but now he found himself in need of underwear, and so the British obliged. Yet Fred had an overall negative reaction to said garments. Quote, They also gave us uh, their underwear, new underwear that was British. And I don't know if you've ever seen that British underwear, but it's horrible stuff. It's more like three-quarter length tights. After a short nap, Larson and some of the other Ohio or Santa Elisa crew were put in the back of a truck and driven around the capital. But soon, the locals were throwing rocks at the men in the back and screaming at them. Their words were incomprehensible, but the meaning behind those rocks were quite clear. Turns out the Maltese thought the mostly American merchantmen were captured German prisoners, as they had on strange American helmets. The British driver jumped out of the truck and eventually calmed everyone down. With that done, the lorry moved out again, and as the crewmen were taken to their lodgings, nothing fancy by the way, given the 3,000 air attacks the city had suffered thus far, they took in firsthand the ruined capital. Buildings without roofs and walls without anything else. The missionary hotel that they were taken to was also damaged, but it did have one working toilet. The men were grateful. And then, one by one, they all got the Malta fever or Malta dog. And suddenly, that one working toilet wasn't nearly enough. But it was better than being bombed on a slow-moving, sinking ship. That night, the air raids returned. Somehow, Larson had not only slipped through the air raid, but when he woke the next morning, the building next to his was gone, and all his flatmates were gone too. They had run off during the air raid during the night and didn't even bother to wake him. Larson then received a visitor who said he was needed at the cable office as a message was waiting for him. And when he walked down the street this time, The Maltese shook his hand and said, Thanks, Yank. The just-read message wiped away the grime, soreness, and shock of the last week. It seems that his wife, Minda, and their son, Jan, were both safe and in Brooklyn. Two miracles in two days. Larson was on a roll. The story of Minda and Jan, or Jan, trapped in occupied Norway, is worthy of its own series. But clearly, all of the hoops that Larson had to jump through, put in front of him by the Nazis, had been worth it. The piles of forms filled out, the money paid over. In time, all of this equaled the liberty of his family. For the next few weeks and months, both Rome and Berlin would crow about pedestal. How the war in the Mediterranean, and thus North Africa, was about to morph into Axis victories. But... History does not bear this out, and the person who did better at expressing this was Elizabeth Leighton Nell, Churchill's secretary. She wrote, It should have been within the enemy's power, as it was clearly his intent, to destroy the convoy utterly. To me, this episode, which was codenamed Pedestal, always seemed the turning point of the war. The time when the news, after being bad, always bad for so long, despite adverse circumstances, turned to encouraging. In more practical terms, the oil from Ohio allowed the 10th submarine flotilla to return to the island from Alexandria. And operating from such a position, Rommel's supplies would lessen. But more than that, the four freighters that had made it to Malta 
Melbourne Star, Rochester Castle, and Port Chalmers. And coming in the next day, but a day before Ohio, the Brisbane Star also carried parts for the island's fighters and bombers. Thus, by September of that year, the very next month, there would be 100 more working fighters on Malta. Again, Rommel would feel the effects. As for the humans on the island, they had a bit more to eat. But that fall, another nine ships reached the island, having very little difficulty in doing so. And on board these vessels was mostly food. The worst was over. And fewer would die from bomb attacks. In July, the month before Pedestal, there were 180 air raids against Malta. In September, there would only be 60. Even better, as touching the war effort in July, 10,000 tons of Axis shipping had been sent to the bottom of the Mediterranean. In September, that number tripled. And taking a page from the Axis, the Allied planes, they focused on the enemy's tankers. As early as September 2nd, Count Ciano, Mussolini's son-in-law and foreign minister, wrote, Rommel is halted in Egypt on account of lack of fuel. Three of our oil tankers have been sunk in two days. Rommel himself backed this up with his own entry diary. These circumstances force the Panzer Army to suspend the offensive. The army will therefore fall back slowly under enemy pressure to the starting line, unless the supply and air situations are fundamentally changed. But there was no force in or around the Mediterranean to make that change. The war was turning for the Allies, who kept up the pressure. Indeed, Pedestal was not the breaking of the access back in the Mediterranean, but like Fred Larson's spine, it was a fracture. And remember Admiral G.W.G. Shrimp Simpson, commander of the 10th Submarine Flotilla? That's right, he would end the war as an admiral. Well, he wrote, This convoy sealed the fate of the Axis armies in Africa. It was confidently felt in the 10th Submarine Flotilla that after the limited but substantial success of Pedestal, we had reached the top of the hill, were on level terms, and having an exhilarating downhill run before us. But most importantly for the larger picture, as Malta had been saved, the Mediterranean was still in play, and that meant it was the perfect place for the Americans to land, versus a cross-channel landing. And the Americans would make their entrance in the European War in three months' time. Lord Gort and Churchill met in Cairo. Gort told what he knew of Pedestal, the facts were still being gathered, but it was enough to bring moisture to the Prime Minister's eyes. After all, he had staked everything on this. As for Gort himself, his appearance is what shocked Churchill and his doctor, Charles Wilson. The doctor wrote, Gort is hardly recognizable. Stone's lighter. The fat boy, as he was called, had disappeared, and in his place is a man years older, with sunken cheeks and tired eyes. The island has been on short commons, and the governor has been setting an example in rationing. He has the character enough for anything. It was then that Gort returned to Malta to award her people the George Cross. The scroll that went with it read, To honor her brave people, I award the George Cross to the island fortress of Malta, to bear witness to a heroism and devotion that will long be famous in history. As for Frederick August Larson Jr. and Francis Alonzo Dales, on May 22, 1943, they were awarded the Merchant Marine Distinguished Service Medal for heroism above and beyond the call of duty. The citation ended with, The magnificent courage of this third young officer and cadet midshipman constitutes a degree of heroism which will be an enduring inspiration to seamen of the United States Merchant Marine everywhere. In 1944, Larson became a master, that is, the captain of his own ship, and he would be a part of 65 convoys by the time the war ended. And he was the commodore of the first convoy to disembark in Amsterdam after VE Day. Fred Larson died one day after the 52nd anniversary of his receiving the Distinguished Service Medal in 1999.
As for Lonnie Dales, the Robin to Larson's Batman, he received the Graceline's gold medal for bravery as well. And as soon as he got home, he went right back to the Mediterranean on the Santa Maria, a sister ship of the Santa Elisa. And in the near future, he would be a part of Operation Torch, the American landing in North Africa. Working hard, Dales graduated the Merchant Marine Academy in 1943, and by 1945 was a chief mate on a victory ship, which just happened to be in the Pacific, bulging with ammunition for the invasion of Japan when the war came to an end. The victory ship was a cargo vessel that replaced the Liberty ships, as too many of them were lost to German submarines. And because they were a latter version, they were larger and faster than the Liberty ships. Between 1944 and 1946, 531 of them were built, and Lonnie Dales was the chief mate of one. And like many people in the Merchant Marine, the transition or arc of that ship compared to the old ones, well, they could only wish they had the Liberty ships sooner. Staying with Lonnie, in 1948, he became the captain of his own oil tanker. But the next year, he got married, so he went into construction to be closer to home. Lonnie Dales died in 2003. As for Admiral Cunningham, a.k.a. ABC, he would be called back to London to help General Eisenhower plan out Operation Torch. The year after that, Cunningham replaced Dudley Pound as First Sea Lord. On December 7th, 1943, FDR visited Malta himself. His speech to the Maltese read, in part, Under repeated fire from the skies, Malta stood, alone but unafraid, in the center of the sea, one tiny bright flame in the darkness, a beacon for the clearer days which have come. Malta's story of human fortitude and courage will be read by posterity with wonder and gratitude through all the ages. And he was right. As for Captain Dudley Mason of the Ohio, he was cheered and revered as the greatest thing since sliced bread. Articles about him had titles like Greatest Drama of the Year or They Sailed into Hell. And he was awarded the George Cross Medal along with the Maltese people. But saving the best for last, the tanker Ohio herself. The old girl would simply not give up. Or at least that's what many believed. After the oil was removed from her, the cruise had started again right away when she was settled into her place at 9.45 a.m. on August 15th, the battered and bruised Ohio went straight down to the bottom of the harbor. Seems it was the oil holding her afloat the entire time. But now it was gone, and so she gave into gravity and fate. For the rest of the war, she was parked in a corner of Valletta Harbor and used for storage. But in 1946, now that it was safe, the tanker that could was towed 10 miles out to sea and charges were placed in her holds. They went off and her back finally broke. The two pieces went down, disappearing from sight forever. But it must be noted that for all of her damage, when she was pumped clean of her contents, she had only lost 15% of it which means that she gave to Malta 1,430 tons of kerosene, 8,695 tons of aviation fuel, 902 tons of bunker fuel, and 2,000 gallons of lubricating oil. And as there was a raid warning that morning that she came in, but not an actual raid, that turned out to be a precursor of what was to come for the Axis. Field Marshal Albert Kesselring had to assign more and more planes, fighters, and bombers to protecting Axis shipments to Rommel. For example, during that same month, August, 565 bombers and reconnaissance sorties were launched to protect their own ships going to North Africa, whereas only 272 sorties were sent against Allied vessels in the Mediterranean, and it would only get worse. Kesselring would make a modest attempt in October, but he could see that the writing was on the wall. Malta was safe. The Allies were growing stronger in the Mediterranean and in North Africa, and that 
had to do with Malta. His window of opportunity had closed, just as he had told Hitler it would. As for the British, they were the experienced half of the Allies, but that did not stop them from doing a post-mortem on pedestal to see how it could have been done better. The first thing they realized is that AA fire is rarely effective. No, one has to fight planes with planes. Speaking of which, the Axis lost 62 aircraft during pedestal. Britain's air arm fleet lost 13 planes in action, but another 16 planes when the carrier Eagle was sunk. But it's those very losses of pedestal that showed the world that the Allies were willing to fight and die if necessary. The Italians mostly were not willing to die, and it showed in their fighting, but to each his own. And now Hitler and Stalin were put on notice. The Western Allies were far from licked. Since August 15, 1942, historians, naval personnel, and others have argued if Pedestal was a success or not. Was it worth it or not? Then the questions get more specific. Was Pedestal a tactical disaster but a strategic victory, or was it the other way around? Who was to judge? But it must be remembered that Pedestal was one of many things happening at the same time. War is action and decisions that force those at the top to wear many hats, again, all at the same time. Decisions are made in that swirling, complex world where we, the readers, know more than they do at the time. Thus, license must be made for that. And at the end of the day, only a fool wins something like a war and then says, let's go back, I think we could have done it better. No, the British were content with what happened. And war, like life, is a tapestry. If you begin to unravel just one section, thinking you can make it better, well, soon you are left holding something completely different, something you may not like. Wars are to be fought and won, but avoided, if at all possible. In the end, Pedestal forced the Axis to commit serious air and naval resources to the Mediterranean which helped the Allied Air Force take control of the air over Egypt and North Africa, which helped spell doom for Rommel. And, of course, there was the continuation of using Malta as a base, like controlling the middle of a chessboard. And that person has no trouble going on the offensive in any direction, and going on the offensive is how wars are won, eventually. Postscript. In case you did not know... The world is not a fair place. It never was. It never will be. So when I tell you that Commodore Venables of the Port Chalmers, you know, the guy who tried to turn around and make for Gibraltar, he was awarded the DSO, or Distinguished Service Order. But it was considered a political and military expedient, which is a regular feature in war and politics. Admiral Neville Seifert was knighted for his part in pedestal, and he would stay to lead Force H at Gibraltar until 1943, when he was promoted to Vice Chief of the Naval Staff. Seifert died in 1972. He was 83 years old. Alas, Roger Hill of the Leadbury, exhausted as much as everyone else, was also saddened when he was not promoted after pedestal but he did receive a DSO. Yet he was soon off his game. He was suffering from a near-nervous breakdown and was upset by his men not being properly compensated during pedestal. So he marched into the office of the commander-in-chief and told all before him how he felt. Not a good move. But this was more about his depression than a sense of justice. He later wrote, I did not realize at the time what a bad state I was in and how unpleasant I had become to serve with. And yet, Hill stayed with the destroyers for the rest of the war, but then after that, he moved to New Zealand. While getting on with his life, he wrote a memoir, Destroyer Captain. Roger Hill died in 2001, and his ashes were scattered in the Mediterranean just off Malta. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So just real quickly, I'd like to add a PPS to my PS. I hope you like change.
And finally, as far as new members, I'd like to say hello and welcome aboard to Hunter O'Malley from Taylorsville, Utah, for becoming a member. Thank you very much, Hunter. And I got a very lovely email from a Wesley Woods, uh, who was letting me know that he recently found the podcast. He's been tearing through it, and I'm glad there's 400 and something episodes to keep you busy, Wesley. And also on a side note, he does have a book that some of you might be interested in if you have little kids. It's called the Little Wizard. Take care, everyone. Okay, honey, we need 58 burgers and 31 hot dogs. I thought we were having a nice little 4th of July family cookout. I saved so much at BJ's Wholesale Club that I was able to invite a few extra people. Plus, I saved 50 cents a gallon at BJ's Gas. Save 50 cents a gallon at BJ's Gas when you first spend $150 in one qualifying transaction through July 4th. Important terms and restrictions apply. Visit BJ's.com slash great fourth fill up. Not a member? Join today. Well, who's that guy on the diving board? Get it, bro! He got my buns wet. BJ's. Absurdly simple savings.